turns out there is water all over the moon. What are we going to do with it? Well, not like literal seas. Neil Armstrong and the crew landed there, and we don't see any water anywhere on those pics. And that's because it's not in actual puddles, or even in ice. Instead, it's stored there as individual H2O molecules. These teeny tiny water molecules are bound to the lunar soil or minerals, like they're trapped. They're scattered everywhere throughout the surface, mixed in with the dust and rocks. There could also be small amounts of ice on the dark side of the moon. A team of researchers from the Planetary Science Institute found them from new mineral maps of the moon, super detailed pictures of its surface. The maps are made using spacecraft. It takes lots of pictures of the moon from all angles, including the dark side, which we never see, and sends it to us. Usually, spacecraft detect just three basic colors our eyes see, red, blue, and green. The Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft, on the other hand, was equipped with a cool, special tool, an imaging spectrometer. This one has a huge range of 85 different colors, from visible light to infrared. It even detects stuff that our eyes can't. This includes traces of water, and they discovered tons of it, even in places that are constantly scorched by the sun and should have been dry. Another thing they found was the hydroxyl group. It's a simple combination of oxygen and hydrogen hanging out together. You can think of it as a tag that can attach to larger molecules, kind of like an accessory that changes their properties and how they work. It also hints on moisture presence all over the place. But hold on a second. Try to guess how many water molecules are there in a single droplet of water. The answer is 1.67 sextillion. That's a number with 21 zeros. If we need such an insane amount of H2O for one tiny droplet, why would we care for these random single molecules in dust? The thing is, they could be super important for future astronauts on the moon. When you're far from Earth, every water molecule counts. If we can find large enough areas where H2Os are more concentrated, the astronauts could extract and collect them for usage. Of course, they wouldn't gather the molecules one by one, that would be crazy. Instead, they could use heating techniques to release the water from the lunar soil or minerals. Imagine heating a big pile of moon dust. This would cause those tiny trapped molecules to free up and combine into water vapor. They'd capture it, and that vapor can be condensed into actual usable water. Scientists can measure exactly how much vapor is being produced per unit of lunar soil. And based on that, they can estimate how much soil they'd need to heat to get a liter of water, for example. This process has already been tested in various ways during moon mission planning, so they wouldn't be going in blind. While each of these heated collections can get us only a small amount of water, over time, they could extract enough of it for drinking, producing oxygen for astronauts, and even creating fuel. So all this means that the moon has tons of the resource that would be life-saving for future moon missions. At first, astronomers thought they'd need to carry all this water from Earth, or that the astronauts would have to travel to the poles to find water. But now it turns out that we could produce it right there, even on the hot equator, which would make things so much easier. But these aren't the only important discoveries. The mineral maps also showed that the youngest parts of the moon held far less water. These youngest parts are called lunar mares. In simple words, they're just volcanic basins. Those large, beautiful dark areas you can see when looking at the moon, like Mare Imbrium and Oceanus Procolarum, were actually formed by ancient volcanic activity. They're considered the youngest parts of the moon in terms of geological history but they're incredibly old. From about 3.16 to 4.2 billion years. The moon itself, however, is about 4.5 billion years old. When the moon was very young, meteorites just wouldn't leave her alone. All the impacts formed large impact basins. They also thinned the crust in some regions, shaking up the ground a little, which made it more prone to volcanic activity. When volcanoes went wild, it lasted for billions of years. 
it was a slow and steady outpouring of molten rock. Lava flows filled these impact basins. Then it cooled down, solidified as dark basalt and other stuff, and created the lunar mares. The fact that lunar mares have less water in them means that all this volcanic activity may have dried out the soil. The volcanoes prevented water from being trapped there as much as in older parts of the moon. That's interesting, because it means that some geological processes like volcanoes influence where we can find water on other planets and moons. But there's an even more thrilling discovery. Meteor craters exposing water beneath the surface. When meteors hit the moon, they create craters, digging deep into the lunar surface. When this happens, rocks from deep inside the moon get thrown out all over the place. Scientists found out that these deeper rocks have more water than the ones on the surface. Unfortunately, it's crazy hot on the moon during daylight, up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it quickly evaporates. What's left behind is hydroxyl we mentioned. That's why there's so much of it. This is thrilling because it means there might be much, much more water deep beneath the moon. Deep inside where it's warm and there's pressure, there might still be liquid water as we imagine it. There could even be underground lakes. For that, we only need three things. A place where water can collect, heat to keep it liquid, and something to keep it from escaping into space. Like layers of ice, maybe, that act as a barrier for the lakes so they wouldn't leak out. Maybe we'll discover them someday, and that would be awesome. For a long time, scientists believed that water in space was super rare, and finding it would be a lucky occurrence. We thought Earth's water was brought here by icy comets and asteroids, making our planet very special. But as it turns out, we're not special at all. A team of scientists discovered that water is almost everywhere in space. They recently studied a young star called V883 Orionis. It's super far from us, 1,300 light years away. That's about 1% of the entire Milky Way. There, they discovered something amazing. Water vapor surrounding the star, much like what we see in our own solar system. What it means is that water isn't transferred to planets by distant comets. It can form naturally around their stars. Water in space starts forming around young stars, like our sun, inside giant clouds of gas and dust. In these clouds, hydrogen and oxygen atoms come together to form water molecules. At first, this water is often frozen, sticking to tiny dust particles. All this mix of gas, dust, and ice surrounds the newborn star like a blanket. Over time, the dust particles with frozen water bump into each other. They gradually form bigger objects like comets, asteroids, and planets. And as you can guess, they also unite all these speckles of ice together. This way, water eventually gets delivered to planets or stays locked inside them. So now, scientists think that water wasn't carried to Earth from somewhere else. But instead, it was with us right from the beginning. Our planet absorbed ice and vapor directly from its surroundings when it was forming. And since the Moon was essentially a huge chunk of Earth that got its own orbit, it also has quite a bunch of water molecules. All this is an awesome discovery because it means that not only water could be almost everywhere in the universe, but also that there could be lots of it in our own solar system. Which means that the chances of finding habitable worlds are much higher than we once believed. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.